KLDR Radio Online, St. Louis, Missouri. Thank you for joining us on the Ultimate Leadership Podcast. And here's your host, Chris Sabalero. Well, here it is, ladies and gentlemen. Once again, it's time for the Ultimate Leadership Podcast. I am your host, Chris Sabalero, and I have to tell you, I am so excited. If you can see me, this is my excited face as we have a guest here that's going to really kind of, I think, blow the doors off our feelings of how do we do the things that we think are difficult. Did you have a difficult day? Do you have difficult goals? Have you had a difficult experience that's really kind of given you the pause to say, how do I get this done? Well, let me tell you what, our next guest is going to make those feel like anything is conquerable. We are so excited to have our guest, Vivian James Rigney. He has been one of a handful of people that has summited Mount Everest. And you may say, Mount Everest, big deal. I'm not saying that. But he has also summited the seven highest peaks on the seven continents. And I got to tell you, that's just amazing. I I had trouble getting over a snowbank the other day here in St. Louis. But I am excited to have him here. I mean, Vivian James Rigney, he's the president and CEO of Inside Us LLC. It's a boutique executive consulting firm, and he operates on five continents. He has helped implement leadership development initiatives for some of the world's largest companies and their executive teams. And I have to tell you, on March 8th, his book, Naked at the Knife Edge, is going to be coming out and it's available for pre-order. I have pre-ordered it to contribute to his retirement. But here he is, our guest, Vivian James Rigney. I want to thank you for joining us on the Ultimate Leadership Podcast. You're welcome, Chris. Great to be here. I got to tell you, I mean, when I heard Mount Everest, I was impressed. There was a time there before COVID, I wanted to take that little trek to Everest Base Camp. I am nowhere near the climber to even think about to get up Mount Everest. But then as I read your bio, I mean the seven summits you did as well. And, uh, but I want to get into that. I want to talk about that. But the first question that I like to ask authors is what was your catalyst for writing this book? What do you, what do you hope people get out of it, Vivian? Well, good question. So I'd summoned at Everest and within the first year or two of, of, of being on there, I got, a, I got a, most of the rest of my team wrote their books on it. So I knew I, there was a book inside me, but it felt too soon to write it. Um, the, the journey was quite profound for me personally. So I said, I'll, I'll, I will do it. I'll just I'll marinate it, let life happen. I will, I will gather the learnings and then write a book. I got busy with life and then uh, COVID got, got, got busy with me. So in March 2020, everything stopped. The, wheat, the mu- music stopped and I said, this is the time. So that's when I literally just um, took pen to paper and started writing writing, writing of climbing Everest and the journey. And, you know, life sometimes puts these things in a way and it all works out. So the marination process did its business. And I think that's reflected in the book and reflected in the the journey that that's there. Well, I'm excited to read it. And I got to tell you, anytime you take this and what you're doing is you're taking these experiences and you're moving it into the professional world of executive coaching. And we'll kind of talk about that a little bit. But one of the things that I would want to know is as you were, I mean, because you climbed Mount Everest away, it was about 2010, if I'm not mistaken. Um, right. But as you were writing this now in the present day, was there was there something that happened that did you put on paper that you just had to sit back and say, that's right, that happened. I mean, it kind of caught back up to you. Yeah, I think the uh, the trauma of the pandemic, I remember those first few weeks of the pandemic, I was in New York City, everything was, everybody was locked down, people were on their balconies, banging pots and saucepans, you know, at 7 p.m. It was that surreal, almost like a movie. And we were all actors in the movie with, without without choice. That, that was our reality. So intense sirens in the streets, this intense pressure. So that's where I started. And I remember writing, you know, with this happening outside. And Everest, Everest was ever present. So that feeling when I went through my barrier of not being in control, all the uncontrollables on Everest, all the uh, the stresses, the things that you kind of plan for, the reactions, the impulses, all the things that are happening around you, people around you, the weather. So it felt like it was one storm that the storm of the pandemic was reflected in, in, in an incredible, incredible way. That, uh, there was a lot of alignment with Everest itself on my personal journey. So those two came together. 
Yeah, very interesting. And and I would think that that kind of gives you a little bit of time to reflect. And I love how you went ahead and put pen to paper in another big time frame where things kind of slowed down. So I think that kind of worked well. And as I mentioned, I'm excited to read it when it comes out. You know, so I, I do want to ask you probably the only guy I'm ever going to talk to that climbed Mount Everest, right? So I do want to talk about this experience a little bit. And there's a lot of things that people don't know. Like it takes you six weeks to get up this mountain. This isn't something you do in an hour, right? You, you've got to now be able to take this time. And then, you know, on summit day, it, it's probably like a 22, 24 hour process to get to the top. But, you know, just I want to take you through that six weeks. So as you start off, I'm sure, you know, the adrenaline pumping and you're ready to finally get this underway what was your biggest i don't want to say fear I, I mean you can't really have fear until you really start to experience but what was your biggest challenge to just get on that base camp to say let's go and get up this mountain the um well, just think of it base camp is sixteen thousand feet so that that is where we start so if you can imagine base camp has been sixteen thousand feet has been where we begin and then everest itself is twenty nine thousand feet almost almost nine thousand meters so just by the time you arrive in base camp, you're out of breath, your body is going, this is the place where we probably shouldn't be here, you know, in all honesty, and everything we have to do has to be planned for. And, and I think that was the big awakening, just arriving at base camp, you got that, you got that big wake up call. The other thing that struck me was um, when you arrive in base camp, we're, our tents, our base camp is, is, is located on a glacier, a glacier that moves. So I remember our first night in the camp at 2 a.m., there's this massive crack loud crack and a movement in our tents. And of course, everyone, you know, in my expedition woke up, the tents were unzipped. We were all coming out. We we're like, what's going on? We could feel this, this movement. And then Scott, our guide, who had actually summited four times before. So he was an old hand at this. He's our, our lead guide. Basically looked around and said, don't worry, guys, drama's over. We're going to get used to this. This is a glacier moving. So that was that, you know, fear was compounded by the fact that we were on a living glacier, which was expanding, which was cracking, which was breaking underneath us. And that was base camp. Yeah, I got to tell you, I mean, that's just amazing. And certainly uh, it makes you kind of think, what the heck am I doing here? Right. And, you know, you hear about all those, you know, the avalanches that happen and, you know, just a few years back where, you know, a lot of Sherpas were lost and, and so on, you've got to be, just be prepared. I mean, just even resting has got to be a little bit challenging, but now as you take this trek and you start to get up the mountain, you leave base camp, does the six weeks start there after you leave base camp to get to the top or, you know, what's this process to finally get to 29,000 feet? So it's three rotations. So basically, you know, base camp is our starting point. And then we first rotation is you go up to camp one through the Kumbo Icefall, the most dangerous part of, of the climb, which is through this almost think of like a massive oversized bowl of popcorn. And within that, we are ant sized, you know, beings. So the huge uh, lumps of ice, very unstable during the day, avalanches, um, a lot of danger, a lot of people die in the Kumbo Icefall. The top of that is camp one. We spend one night at camp one. Then we come through the go up to the western cum, a very, very expansive valley, all the way to Camp Two. We spend a few nights there to acclimatize. We bring equipment up, gear up, tents, some food supplies. We bury it in the snow. We spend a couple of nights there to acclimatize, then all the way back down through the Kumbo Ice Fall, back to base camp. Okay. More training at base camp. And then we plan for rotation two, rotation two, all the way up through the Combo Ice Fall again to camp one, to camp two, spend some days there, acclimatize again. Our red blood cells are propagating. So we're handling more of the lower oxygen level in the blood. And then we, we try and get up to camp three, which is halfway up the Lhotse ice face, almost a, an almost vertical uh, ice face. It's almost like climbing on glass. Um, we spend an afternoon there. So just we go up almost a tip at, all the way back down, back to base camp. And that's about, that is about five or six weeks in. At wow. that point, all of my body, which was, you know, nicely worked, toned, lots of muscle, lots of fit, all of it's gone. So I'm left with pretty much my rib cage. It's fascinating. So your body starts devouring itself. The moment you're at base camp, your body starts to consume itself. Wow. Even though you're eating five, six, 7,000 calories a day. Then we go down into the valley because at that point we need to replenish ourselves. So we go down a couple of, again, five or 6,000 feet further into one of the tea houses, the Sherpa tea houses. And we basically eat for, for three days and we rest and we recalibrate. And then we come back to base camp and then the guides open up their laptops. And that's when they start to look at the weather, the satellites, the weather reports. And that is where we, we wait probably for a week or two for our summit bid 
when a weather window on Everest, it's about it's about probably anything from 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 four to eight days days in the climbing season where you can actually summit. Right. Everything else around that impossible. We wait for that window and then we begin our summit, which takes our summit attempt, our third rotation. And we are up and down the mountain in about five or six days. Yeah. So it just shows you it is a step by step process with three significant chunks of chunks of effort, planning, time, and risk. Yeah. And I think that that's one of the things that people don't know. And we see those long, long lines now of people trying to get to the summit. There's only four to eight days a year you can get to the top of this mountain. It's not like they do it all year round, right? So, um, which is something that's really interesting now. It seems that everybody is trying to get to the top of that. So, one of the things that I was thinking, you know, before we transition here, and I want to learn a little bit more is as you're online to get to the summit and you're on, get coming up to Hillary's step, what are you feeling? What are you thinking? What are you hoping to see when you stand on the world's tallest peak? Well, when you when you climb higher and higher, something interesting happens. When we saw on our summit day, when we saw the uh, the sunrise, you could actually notice the curvature of the Earth. So in a way, you feel like an astronaut. It's it's a bizarre experience. The other thing you look at when you look across and you realize you see the sunrise, you realize we are above everything, everybody else on the planet. But we also realize that the sunrise that, that it's a, quite an emotional. That summit day is very emotional because we're basically running on fumes at that point. And we're looking down at that sunrise and thinking that everyone else on the planet is going about their daily lives in school, sleep, uh, at work, whatever it is. So it's, it's that summit day is a, a transformative day. And then we get up to toward the south summit. And that's when the fun starts, because at the south summit, you see Hillary step in front of you. But also in front of you is a 100 foot or 150 foot knife edge. Uh, and that's about... Uh, 8,000 feet down into Tibet, and then another, you know, uh, 4,000 feet down to uh, Camp 2 in Nepal. You have to cross that knife edge in order to get onto Hillary Step, which is basically one rope, everybody going up and coming down on that one rope. And you look up and you see people literally swinging off the rope. You see their crampons sliding, trying to grasp on the rock. It's everything about it is, 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 da- is dangerous. And every cell in your body is saying, I really shouldn't be here. Sure. Uh, which for me was a profound um, feeling because at the South Summit, uh, the, the, you know, the premise of the book, you know, the book is called Naked at the Knife Edge. And that's the premise of the, that what I went through at the South Summit for me was the, what encapsulates the entire book, yeah. the story of vulnerability. And that's a story in itself. And I think that that's a great transition into talking about the book, Naked at the Knife Edge. You know, really, it's your you know, true account to the summoning of Everest. And, you know, you, you got to be a, a strong guy. I mean, mentally and physically, right? I mean, self-confident, you know, good self-esteem. I mean, so as you're climbing this mountain, how did it, how did it affect you? I'm sure, you know, when you mentioned it yourself, you know, you're chiseled, you know, you're, 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 you're in great shape. And then all of a sudden you're just rib cage because of dealing with the consumption of your body being up at that altitude. How did it affect you, you know, maybe more emotionally than physically? Yeah, two things. One thing that's at base camp it was about two weeks into the expedition. Um, we're, we're, we're training, but there's a lot of downtime. We're waiting for weather. We're waiting for acclimatization. And remember two weeks in, just go, you're spent a lot of time in the tent alone at, at, that, at that part. And I remember thinking, um, I got a bit, a little bit down after two weeks thinking, geez, it just struck me. If something happens to me on the mountain, I fall into a crevasse. If, if, if I, you know, if I, if I lose my grip and if that's my demise, it's the end of me, what would I leave down, down below at sea level? What would I believe? And, you know, we're rushing day by day. We're rushing through our jobs. We're busy with stuff. We're busy with families. We're, we're doing it all, but to actually think what legacy is. And I remember thinking, almost like a shock, a shock of thought in my mind that I cannot change anything that I've left down there. So the die is cast. If something were to happen to me, what I have left down there is what will people will remember me by. And then the next question was, will they remember me for what I have achieved or how I made them feel? And the answer was uh, more of what I've achieved. And that was the wrong answer. So that that, that counted that feeling of, geez, I, I wish I could call people. I wish I could you know, write to people. I wish I could have interactions and say, you know what, you were incredibly impactful in my life, but we don't do that. Uh, and there I was on Everest at 39 years of age uh, thinking, I can't change anything. So the promise I made to myself was if I come down off this mountain, one piece, two arms and two legs, 
I will be conscious of that. I will value that. And I will do something about that. That's the first piece. The second piece was getting to the South Summit. As I said, just on the cusp of climbing through that over that knife edge onto Hillary Step, the most tricky part of the mountain as we summit on summit day. And I remember uh, reaching the South Summit, one of our guides was leaning against a rock and he was ill and he was, you know, ashen faced. Uh, he said, basically, I don't think I can do it this year. This is the, the guy who summited four times. So that feeling of immense feeling of being feeling exposed. I mean, our guide is feeling unwell. He subsequently summited, but at that point he was feeling unwell. And I remember um, I was not doing well on summit day. I, I didn't have enough oxygen. I felt I was, I was uh, my fatigue was really kicking in. My body was starting to, to push back against me, against my brain, which was saying, just keep going, keep going. And I remember um, actually feeling totally out of energy at that point in time, to such a degree that I got extremely emotional at that point. And I was thinking, geez, I can't get up the mountain, but but I can't get down the mountain. My legs turned to jelly. I remember, and I've felt there's almost this dark cloud over my head at that time. Uh, and I remember feeling really despondent because what I had a few weeks earlier about legacy, like this is it. When I think about it, this is it. So I went to a kind of a dark place, but I remember closing my eyes and I remember my eyes, they immediately froze. I remember the tears were, were frozen on my eyes. And I remember this voice came from deep within me, Chris. And the voice said to me, why are you here? And the voice, an unfamiliar voice, very deep. I'd never heard it before, but it was coming from the core of my subconscious mind. And I said it again, why are you here? And I had no answer. So I felt even more, even more kind of emotional and traumatized by, I don't even know why I'm here. And then it said something else. It said, why are you always trying to prove how smart you are, how good you are, how strong you are, how, how good a son you are, how good a brother you are? And, you know, it's not, not the ideal place to have this negative inner dialogue because at, at this point, every negative thought drains energy, less energy for my body, less energy for my breathing. So the only thing I could do to get away from that was to think of something totally different. And I thought of my brother who I lost um, in an accident many years before. And the moment I thought of him, uh, all that inner dialogue went quiet. And then, then I found myself just at peace. Uh, I didn't have the answer for, for why I was here, but I knew that I was at peace. And if I needed to sit on this rock, and that would be the end of me, and I would, this was where I would rest, and other climbers in years to come would be, would be passing me. I felt that sense of peace and I can't explain it. It was an absolute on the cusp of death experience where I had to let go and I had to understand what my purpose was. I didn't have the answer then, but at least I could find that peace. I don't know how long it was, maybe a few minutes, but I remember a tap on my shoulder from my Sherpa and uh, he, he, I was, my, 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 I, had to, I had to literally break the, the ice from my eyes, from my tears and he pulled hit my, hit my face right up close to his. And I could see his, his big almond eyes, his weathered face, this man of purpose, strong, sharp, wonderful person. He pulled me right in close and he said, we must go. And I said, I, I don't think I can go. And he said, we stay, we die. We must go. And I just looked at him and I, I had nothing to say. And he said two words. He said, follow me. And I looked at that face and I just gave myself to that man. I trusted him implicitly. I immediately saw his strength and I followed, followed him. And I put my, he, wherever he put his left boot, Chris, I put my left foot boot. Where he put his right boot, right boot, my right boot followed. And such a time. I have no recollection of walking over the knife edge. I remember almost like coming to halfway up Hillary step because the rope was starting to swing and I was losing my grip. And I remember thinking, Jesus, I thought he was taking me down. He's taking me up. So my, my concentration was solely following his boots on the rock, on the rock. And we slowly climbed and slowly climbed and slowly reached the top until there was no more height to ascend. And we reached the top of the mountain. And I remember looking around thinking, everything is below me. Every single thing on this planet is below me. That was my moment for being an astronaut. Um, but the question was still, why are you here?
Yeah, I got to tell you, it's, it's a great question. And I'm enthralled by the story. I don't want to interrupt you in any at any point there, because, you know, one of the things that you're dealing with now is your own mortality, right? You're you're basically almost giving up to say this is where people are going to find me, you know, as they come walking up this mountain. So, you know, when you think about it, you know, you kind of ask yourself the question, why do you have to be so strong? Why do you have to be so smart? Why do you have to be the best? This is kind of the ego that we deal with, right? So in your book, you really talk about the ego trap. Can you give us some tips or can you kind of talk about how do you overcome that ego trap? Because you were right in the middle of it on that mountain. Right. And I think the, the, the whole premise of this book is based on to be a great leader. Look, I work, at a, I work as an executive coach. I work with, with senior leaders and C-suite folks every day. These people are inherently lonely. Uh, they're trying to do a lot. They have these same questions, but they find it very hard to be vulnerable unless people judge them on that. But the main thing is you have to be honest to yourself. If you're not honest to yourself, then it, you're not going to come over in an authentic way to other people. People are not going to follow you. You're not going to influence them. So people are going to hear the words, but not the meaning associated with that. So that honesty to self is really important. And also, I think the, the, the key thing there is managing your energy. For me, it was finite. Energy was breathing. Energy was what's happening in my head. In, in leadership and business life, it's the same thing. Energy is the finite resource and time, of course. But those two are, 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 are intertwined and being highly aware of that and managing that intuition is the big gift where we tend to over engineer as we get more in our careers we tend to worry about things that perhaps we don't need to worry about we can become less efficient so it's about becoming lighter and more clear a purpose that's clear a clearer in our own minds our own head more intuitive and how do we influence others to, at scale, right? And the, again, within leadership, it's all about scalability of people toward the purpose, but also the execution and leaders and that, that ability to be lighter and faster in doing that. And the mountain is a good metaphor for, for the importance of being lighter. Yeah. And I think that you really kind of sum that up and tie that in a little bow. And, you know, in your story, the, the thing that gets me the most is the two words, follow me. As an executive coach in the C-suite, these are, these are people who are, and on five continents, no less, but these are people who are in charge of big organizations, big corporations, a lot of responsibility. How do you give them the feel of those two words, follow me, because they're the person who should be taking the workforce by the shoulder and bringing them in to say, we've got to go, follow me. How do you now make this transition from the mountain to your coaching business with these leaders? Yeah, I mean, the big question I ask them is, why would people follow you? And they give me the, you know, the baked answers because we're doing this, because that's purpose. I said, no, that's my question. Why would they follow you? I want to underline, underline the word you. And underlining, underlining the word you brings it back to who are you at your core? How can that be shown? How can vulnerability be shown as a strength? Vulnerability is around transparency. It's around, it's around clarity. It's around, it's around purpose. It's around being authentic. And, and that, and that we, you know, many, many, many leaders, they carry so many, they're very smart, very experienced, but they carry almost, think of it like a backpack, a lot of rocks in the backpack. When we were younger in our career, it feels like ballast. It gives me, it gives me strength. It gives me solidity. We go higher up. We have to choose to let go of some of those rocks to be lighter, to be able to, for people to hear our voice. Yeah. I think that that's a great way to put that. You know, one of the things that you talked about as well is, you know, the feeling of uh, cloud over your head and despair and, you know, almost giving up how important it is, is it to learn how to harness that intuition to say, you know what, I may feel this way. I may feel despondent. I may feel this or cloud, but I just got to keep going. Right. I mean, because that's what you really had to do. And it was, it was the Sherpa who really kind of just gave you the smack in the face to say, let's go. And instead of taking you down, he brought you to where you wanted to be. Right. Talk about that. Harnessing your intuition. Yeah. It's, it's really recognizing when it's okay to ask for help. It's okay. Not to know. It's okay to be curious, to be wildly curious. I'll tell you one story. When I came down the mountain and I got to the bottom, I'd spoken to my family just before we, we passed the Kumbu Ice Fall. And I told them it was very, I spoke to my father, my, my family. I told them it was very difficult. I almost didn't make it, um, but I got there and so forth. I got to the bottom and I, I got on the satellite phone with a family member. And a family member said to me, Vivian, I heard it was difficult. I heard it was a hell of a journey. 
would have expected no less. But listen, the important thing is you got to climb the highest mountain in the world. That's all you need to share with people. And I remember feeling this, almost this anger bubble inside me, almost a red anger. And I was thinking, and I basically said to them, I said, you know what? That's, that's the opposite. It's the opposite. This is the story. The story of the setbacks, the story of the learnings, the story of not knowing, the story of asking for help, the story of figuring it out, the story of following somebody who says, follow me, because that's what I need at that point in time. Authenticity is around where we can show that level of, of reflection, which is wise, a, a level of growth, a level of, 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 of doing it with people, as opposed to thinking that we have to have the answer in our head all the time. We have to be perfect. It's, it's you know... At the end of the day, no one buys that anyway, but we still do it. How do we let go of that? How can we just be smarter with that and understand what fo how followership will follow quickly thereafter? Right. Awesome. Very good stuff. I have two more questions for you. The first one is the people who are going to read this book are going to be inspired. And I got to tell you, this has got to be an incredible key. You're a speaker. This has got to be an incredible keynote address, right? So if people want, I want to talk at the end, how do people reach you, you know, to kind of get you to tell them the story. But so I guess the question I want to ask you again, as an author is when people open this book and I, I pre-ordered it, I can't wait. Um, what do you hope they get out of it? What, what's the one message you hope that they get out of this? So you're able to influence who they are to continue up that mountain. Right. I hope they read it and they, I imagine that they will um, really think for themselves in reading this book. There's a lot of books that give great guides and techniques and tools of how to do something. This book gets people to look in the mirror and really understand themselves and how to do that effectively. You know, in, in, we can't be effective leaders until we're honest with ourselves first. Um, we cannot be effective leaders until we let go of burdens and we utilize our strengths, our experiences, our intuition. And that's probably the biggest takeaway is a highly reflective journey in making us lighter and freer in order to have greater impact. Yeah, I think that's amazing. And that's uh, hopefully once I read it, I'm going to give you a review, let you know what I thought about it. But here's the last question. You ready? You probably know it's coming. Why were you here? What was the answer? My answer was I was proving to people that I left Ireland, right? Small island off the northwest coast of Europe. And I guess I'd, I'd been proving for years that I was good enough. I was strong enough. And I, I, but I forgot to stop. It was this constant drive of more, bigger, better, faster, smarter. And there it was almost like just stop. Stop, use what you have and listen and understand and ask for help. So that profound idea of we can be much smarter with others as opposed to being in our own heads, that for me was a big, massive, massive aha moment and a very humbling moment. Right, well, it's a great story and I'm excited for you. And I'm glad that you were here. And, and you know, uh, you're an executive coach. You, you deal with folks in the C-suite. You're a speaker. You're going to be an author soon. If folks want to get in touch with you and they want to kind of get you to come and tell their story from a keynote address or utilize your services as an executive coach, what's the best way? How can they reach you? Sure. Simple. Vivian, VivianJamesRigney.com. That's it. And I will put that in the show notes for everybody so they can click that. So I got to tell you, man, this has been great. And I can't believe that we've been talking for over 30 minutes already. And I could probably sit here and talk because there's a lot of things that you talk about that are resonating. I'm the guy, I'm the driven guy. I'm the guy who wants to do more. Yeah, I write a book. It becomes a number one bestseller. I want to do something else. That was yesterday. And I'm not smelling the roses like you're telling me to do, right? That yeah, I'm missing something and I'm waiting for the next big thing. And I've had people comment which I thought was a positive comment that I'm the most driven individual they've ever met in their life. And I got to tell you, it wasn't a compliment, right? It was, you're leaving people in your wake. You're supposed to be leading them and supporting them and guiding them. So your story resonates with me and I'm sure it resonates with a lot of other people. And I want to thank you very much for coming and sharing your story. This has been a pleasure. And thanks for having me on. So everybody out there, I got to tell you, naked at the knife edge is going to come out on March 8th, pre-order it now on Amazon. And I'm sure that you're going to have a great time with that, Vivian. Promise you're going to come back and Promise. join us again and share some more stories with us. We got six yeah. other mountains to talk about.
Indeed, indeed. They're all wait. We're all waiting there. So for everybody out there, I want to thank you again for joining us on the Ultimate Leadership Podcast. This is Chris Sabalero, and I look forward to chatting with everyone again real soon. Thank you for joining us. The Ultimate Leadership Podcast is a production of chrissubbalero.com. You can interact with us by email at ultimateleadership16 at gmail.com. All rights reserved.